good to see everyone this morning. I'd like to welcome everyone here. There are two words up on the screen, conservative and liberal. It is a shame that people see these terms and they simply see them as insults. And they say, well, he's a conservative or she's a liberal or whatever. Um, they are not meant to simply, they are not meant as insults. What they, what they show is, is that words have meaning and words have always had meaning. And sometimes, sometimes folks forget that, but, but we understand that words have meaning. These words, which are usually um, used in matters of politics, um, hopefully we understand what it means when someone is conservative politically or liberal politically. The, the definitions for the words, very simply, um, this is not my definition, this is just whatever the computer said. Um, the idea of conservative, it's to be averse to change or, innova or innovation and holding traditional values. That's how the definition begins. Goes on a little bit, but I think we understand that, especially that last part about holding to traditional values. The, the liberal, um, that idea is, and again, this is their definition, um, the, the dictionary's definition, willing to respect or accept behavior or opinions different from one's own, open to new ideas. And, and that's just very simply um, how the words are defined. If someone, as an application, if someone had a conservative view of marriage, well, then what would it be? Right? In our minds, we understand a conservative view of marriage. Okay? Well, what would a liberal view of marriage look like? And hopefully we know kind of how society is gone. But that just kind of gives us a little bit of an, of an understanding of words have meaning. And, and we, it's not just a matter of semantics that we, we need to understand words have meaning. So when people use these, these words, that's, that's what we're talking about. Well, those two mindsets, conservative and liberal, um, they also affect the Lord's church. You have a conservative mindset and you have a liberal mindset. You have two different reactions to what we are going to talk about this morning because what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the silence of scriptures and whether or not we need to respect the silence of scriptures. So when I say that those mindsets of conservative and liberal, when I say those two mindsets especially if you've ever studied church history, and by the way, those who do not learn from history, what are they doomed to do? <laughs> They're doomed to repeat it. So when we talk about learning from church history, hopefully we understand that it's an ongoing thing as an application. But concerning respecting the silence of Scripture, especially in times past, and I would suggest going all the way back 2,000 years, but especially in times past, you have the conservative view of the silence of Scripture. And the conservative view of the silence of Scripture is you speak where the Bible speaks, and you are silent where the Bible is silent. That silence is prohibitive. If God's Word is silent on a subject, then we must restrain ourselves. We cannot proceed. Silence is prohibitive. The liberal view... Right? And remember, conservative, liberal, conservative, it's more prohibitive. The liberal view is more liberating, as it is. Um, the liberal view is silence is permissive. That if God is silent on a matter, then we can proceed however we want to. Right? So you had those two, you, you had those two mindsets still affecting brethren. If God is silent on something, well, we better not do it. If God is silent on something, well, I guess that means we can decide whatever we want to do on our own. And you have those two mindsets. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about, must we respect the silence of scriptures? Must we respect it? Um, to, and, and to just go ahead and get into it. I, I would suggest, in thinking about the silence of scriptures, and I kind of take an unorthodox approach, my question is, has God really been silent? <laughs> I'd start there. Has God really been silent? I want you to look in Matthew. Come over to Matthew 19, just as an example. In Matthew chapter 19, the Lord, and he's, he's teaching in response 
to people who ask about divorce. Right? The Pharisees, they come and they say, is it lawful, verse 3, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? Verse 4 says, Jesus answered, he answered and said to them, have you not read that he who made them, have you not read that he who made them in the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh, therefore what God has joined together let not man separate. So just for an example about silence in scripture. Um, concerning homosexual marriage, what will people argue? They'll say, well, Jesus didn't say anything about homosexual marriage, right? <laughs> okay, A, other scriptures clearly condemn it explicitly, but also B, yes, Jesus did, <laughs> right? When people say, well, Jesus never said anything about homosexual marriage. He was, they're, they're saying he was silent on the matter, and therefore we can do it. What we need to see is, no, <laughs> has Jesus, has God really been silent? No, he very much, he said it very clearly. He defined marriage. And in defining what marriage is, we can in infer what marriage is not. So when people have this idea about the silence of Scripture, what they, what they seem to mean is that God said absolutely nothing about a particular topic, about, a, about a, any topic, that God was silent on some topic. I want you to name just one topic that God was silent on. Just one. <laughs> just one. One topic. You're not going to find it. You're not going to find it. Was God silent on church organization? No. Was God silent on worship in church? No. Was God silent on marriage and how marriage works? No. Was God silent on raising kids? No. Was God silent on how we need to conduct ourselves in the workplace? No. Was God silent on how we treat our friends? No. Was God silent on how we treat our enemies? No. Was God silent on any topic? No. And scripture pretty clearly shows that. If we are truly thoroughly furnished unto every good work, and that is why all scripture has been given, to argue that God has been silent on a topic is to actually denigrate God and say that Scripture does not do its job. So, concerning the silence of Scripture, has God really been silent? No. I don't, I don't believe he has, and I think Scripture bears that out. What we will find in Scripture is what is spoken about, for example, in Philippians. Come over to Philippians chapter 3. Just this idea is what we find in Scripture. Philippians chapter 3 at verse 16. Philippians 3 at verse 16. I want you to just think about this concept. Philippians 3 verse 16 says, Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10 Right, be of the same judgment, same mind, right? The unity that the Corinthians didn't have because they were not of the same mind and not of the same judgment. Verse 17, brethren, join in following my example and note those who so, who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of, of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. To think about that passage, verse 16, let us walk by the same rule. There are rules. <laughs> there are rules. There are multiple verses that talk about that. There are rules. And there in verse 17, he talks about a pattern. There are patterns. There are rules and there are patterns patterns. As you think about that idea of rules and patterns, think about, again, 1 Corinthians. Let all things be done decently and in order. Well, who decides what's orderly? Me and you? No, 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 no. We do not decide the pattern. We follow the pattern. It is the Lord who has declared what is decent and what is orderly. Think about in Hebrews when it talks about Moses building the tabernacle. 
and it says that Moses, that Moses built that house according to the pattern God showed him on the mountain. Now, we all know the whole point of Hebrews. <laughs> the Lord is better. Jesus is better. A greater than Moses has come. And one of the arguments that you can make is, well, if Moses built that house according to the pattern, then what do you think that says about Jesus and his house? There's a pattern. Otherwise, you would not have what Paul tells, can't remember if it's Timothy or Titus, that he was writing to him so he could know how to conduct himself in the church. There's a pattern. Those who do not follow that pattern, to look at this passage in Philippians, those who do not follow that rule, those who do not follow that pattern, the reason they do not do those things is because, as you think about verse 19, whose God is their belly. They are following their own desires. That is why people do not follow the pattern. Because they want to do what they want to do. And they think they are free to do whatever they want to do. They're free to do it, but the Lord talks about whose end is their destruction. So, must we respect the silence of God? Yes, especially considering God hasn't really been silent but if there are matters, if there are matters that perhaps he has been silent on, and I say perhaps intentionally, must we respect the silence of scriptures? Yes, we must, we will, if we want to do things in faith. If we want to do things in faith, we will. We will respect the silence of scriptures. If you think, if anybody thinks, doing things in faith means well, God didn't say not to. If you think that's what it means to operate in faith, you do not understand faith. Right? I know I quote it every, every lesson, and I'm probably going to keep quoting it every lesson. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. All right? Whatever. If I say it, does not make it so. Had a conversation with several folks recently. Um... If I say it, it does not make it so. I am not above reproach. None of us are above reproach. Jesus is the only one. Jesus is the head of the church. Just because I say it, just because I say it does not make it so. Oh, I won't tell you who it is because this particular woman will be really embarrassed. <laughs> She's sitting next to Jeff, though. But anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry. But she has told me and she has shared with others that she has had, and I hope, I don't think she would mind this, she has had trouble in times past because whoever was in the pulpit speaking, she took it as the word of God and not the word of man. And she said she had a lot of trouble because, she, lo and behold, she came to find out as she started studying the word of God, it was not lining up with what was being said. If I say, and I'll quote the Apostle Paul from Galatians 1, if, if I preach any other gospel, then let me be accursed. And Paul says, if we, and he's talking about the apostles, he says, if we are an angel of God, speak any other gospel, then let us be accursed. So do preachers fall into that category? Yes. Do elders fall into that category? Yes. Does every single member of the Lord's church and anybody else fall into that category? Yes, we are not the head of the church. So if we think that faith is just, well... God didn't say not to. If we think faith is just, well, I'm going to do whatever I want to do, that ain't faith, boys and girls. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Will we respect the silence of Scripture? We will if we want to do things in faith. Come to Romans 14. Come over to Romans chapter 14. Verse 21. Romans 14 is the chapter that's about liberties. And in Romans chapter 14 at verse 21, we have the following. It says, It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Um, verse 22, Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself and what he approves. I believe this is where the King James says, If you have faith, keep it to yourself before God. Verse 23, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith for whatever is not from faith is sin. If it's not from faith, it's sin. We have to be operating in faith. The context is liberties, like I said. 
How could Jews and Gentiles get along? How could they get along? That's, that's the issue. And the answer to that is certain things keep it private. One man thinks he can eat whatever he wants. That would be the Gentiles. The other man thinks he can only eat certain things. That would be the Jews. Okay, so how do you get along? Certain things you're going to have to do privately. All right, if you have a Jew, if you're living in the first century, you're a Gentile, and you have a Jew come over to your house and you say, hey, guess what, we're having barbecue tonight. There's probably going to be a lot of Jewish Christians who are going to say, like Peter said, on top of Simon the Tanner's house, when Peter said, not so, Lord, I've never eaten anything unclean. Now, how could Peter say that? I mean, after all, we're after Acts chapter 2. We're after Jesus going to the cross, right? And we know what happened to the cross. According to Colossians, it talks about the old law and the ordinances. They were nailed to the cross. So why didn't all those Jews on the day of Pentecost, all those days later, why didn't they say, huzzah, we can finally have barbecue? <laughs> right? The old law was nailed to the cross. So why had Peter not been eating those things the whole time? It's because that was how he was raised, frankly. That was how he was raised, and he was having trouble with the transition. And don't underestimate what the Lord tells him. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter says, ah, uh, no. <laughs> and the Lord says, again, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Right? He shows him, the, shows him three times. Three times. And finally, Peter has to think about it and realize, oh, we're talking about the Gentiles coming into the kingdom. Oh, I understand a little more about what's going on now. My point is, back to Romans 14, these are individual matters. These are individual liberties. Jews and Gentile, Jewish brethren and Gentile brethren, how could they get along with one another? A, keep it private. Keep it private. If you have faith about something, you keep it to yourself. The moment that the, moment that the cat gets out of the bag, guess what happens? nor do anything which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. So, A, keep it private. But also, I want you to think about within this matter of liberties. These are not congregational matters. These are individual matters. And the reason, the reason that we can see that is because if they were congregational matters, how do you keep that private? <laughs> if this involves the work of the church, how do you keep that private? No, you, you can't keep that private. That's why I say these are individual matters, not congregational matters. So how could you have two individuals, in the context Jewish brethren and Gentile brethren, how could you have, have them practicing two different things and still be in faith? If faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Well, why did Peter, again, for example, why did he not eat certain things? It's because of what was written in the old law. <laughs> Right? It's what was written in the Word of God. Granted, it was the old law, but that's why Peter was doing these things. He was not eating to the Lord. Okay? Now, he needed to come along and recognize the truth of the new covenant, but that's why he was doing these things. Well, why did the Gentiles feel as though they were free to eat anything? It's because they were in the new covenant. Okay? So you have Jews and Gentiles, Jewish brethren and Gentile brethren, ones holding on a little more to the old covenant, even though the law was nailed to the cross, things like that. Um, but then you had the Gentiles. Now, my point is in bringing that up, both were authorized. One was authorized in the old law. One was authorized in the new law. For that matter, here in Romans, when he says, I'm convinced, verse 14, Chapter 14, verse 14, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus there's nothing unclean of itself. All right, we, we recognize all of that. That's the context, okay? Both were authorized, eating, not eating, circumcision, uncircumcision. Both were, both were authorized. Now, if my takeaway from that is, well, I think the church should open up a car wash because I think it would be a good outreach program to the community. Well, is that authorized? I know why the Jews did things. I know why the Gentiles did things. But if I'm going to be operating in faith, they were operating in faith. They ate unto the Lord, or they did not eat unto the Lord. Could someone open up a church-sponsored car wash unto the Lord and say, Huzzah, it is now done in faith. 
<laughs> no. Where's the authority for it? In the Old or New Testament, if you want to go that route, where's the authority for it? But as it is, we're under the New Covenant. To, to think about the idea, because this is the idea, people think, well, God didn't say not to. Is that how faith works? We can do it because God did not say not to? I've shared this, I can't remember if I shared this story or not, um, so pardon me if this is repetitive. My parents knew someone. They knew a, there was a husband and wife, and they had a, had a young child. Um, I believe the child was, I don't know, five or six, something along those lines. And these, this family, they were at their wits' end because their child colored on everything in their room. They colored on everything. They loved their markers and their crowns, and they would, they would just, you would go into their room, and it looked like a bomb went off. They colored on everything. So mom and dad, they sat down, little Susie, or wh whatever the child's name was, pardon Susie's, um, and they, they made a list, and they said, don't write on your dresser, don't write on the floor, don't write on the walls, don't write on the ceiling, don't write on your brother, don't write on the dog, don't write on, don't write on all these things. They, and they came back in an hour later, and she had pulled the sheets off her bed and had drawn all over her sheets. And they said, what did you do that for? And the little girl said, because you did not tell me not to. Really? That's how this works? As you think about faith, and you think about authority, and you think about questions like, does the church have the right to start a college? Right? These are the questions that have come up in times past. Does the church have the authority to start a college? Does it have the authority? Well, God didn't say not to. Does the church have the right to start some other man-made institution? Well, God didn't say not to. And people will come along and they'll say, well, my God is more loving. And I think the Lord just understands. And what it amounts to is, no, you're just going to do what you want to do. That's not the same thing as faith. Must we respect the silence of Scripture? We will if we want to do things in faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. The Romans passage we've already looked at. Now, if silence is permissive, the question has to be asked, where does it stop? Right? If we're going to go this route, well, the Lord didn't say not to. Well, then where does it stop? Where does it stop? And I want to show you something. This is, this is from the cooperative program of the Baptist denomination. This is the Southern Baptist. Okay. So in looking at this, and we're going to blow it up so you can see it. And we'll blow it up individually here in a minute. I want you to think about the question, if silence is permissive, then where does it stop? Okay, so let's see what all these folks are into. So at the top you have individual donors, okay? You have individual donors, they put in their offering to the local church, as they call it, illustrative ministries. I'm not sure what that means, but within that level, you have associational missions, language missions, partnership missions, going down the left side, discipleship, recreation, benevolence, local ministries, staff compensation. On the right side, fellowship, music, worship, children's ministries, youth ministries, single adult ministries, median adult ministries. You didn't know there was such a thing as median adults, did you? Oh, I'm a median adult. Senior adult ministries, Christian education. But then you go further up the food chain. All right, the cooperative program continues on, and you have the state convention, where you have, again, along the left, church health, disaster relief, evangelism, resort missions. That sounds nice, doesn't it? Language missions, foundations, convention operations, Christian higher education on the right, Christian higher education, collegiate ministries, children's homes, ethnic church planting, Anglo church planting. Hmm. Seems kind of non-PC in this day and age. Publications, conference centers. We ain't done yet. It goes on to the national level. 
Then you have Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, all the different seminaries over there on the left. You have some more. And then it keeps going to the world, and you have Guidestone Financial Resources there on the right-hand side, Lifeway Christian Resources, Lifeway Bible stores, um, bookstores, things like that, Woman's Missionary Union, Along the left, you have the Executive Committee of the Southern Baptist Convention, the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission, International Mission Board, North American Mission Board. Oh, that was just exhausting, wasn't it? Right? As you think about our question, where does it stop? Once you open up Pandora's box, where does it stop? If you take the view, well, silence is permission. Well, then where does it stop? I remember I heard two Pentecostal pastors, they were talking one time, and they had had, um, it was their outdoor revival. And they were so, they were so happy with their, with their outdoor revival. In the building, in the, their usual services, they just had, um, just had an organ, had the organ player. But for their revival, they brought out everything. They had a horn section, and they had the organ going, and the, it was it was wonderful in their eyes. Two pastors were talking to each other. They thought privately, but I was close enough. I was able to eavesdrop. And the one pastor said, well, I really enjoyed all this, but I just don't think drums belong in a church. I just don't think drums belong. That was his line in the sand. Okay, now how arbitrary is that? Oh, so you just don't like per the percussion section? <laughs> that was his arbitrary line in the sand. If silence is permissive, where does it stop? It doesn't. It doesn't. And in a sense, all roads lead to Rome. And what I mean by that is these denominations, most of them, they've been around for about anywhere from 100 to 500 years. The Catholic denomination has been around a little bit longer. And all roads, all the broad path leads to Rome in a sense. Because what the Catholic Church actually teaches, the Catholic Church does not believe that the Holy Spirit in revealing the truth and then the truth gave the church. They believe it's actually the opposite. They believe that the, they don't believe that in the sense of scripture, and when I say scripture, I mean the Holy Spirit. They don't believe that scripture gives the church. They believe the church gives scripture. I want, you to I want you to let that sink in. They believe that the church gives scripture. And as they give scripture, they have the right to change scripture. They have the right to do whatever they want to do. And that's why when it comes to Catholic authority, you have the three-legged stool. The way the Catholic Church establishes, establishes authority, they say the Bible is one leg, church tradition is another leg, right? So that's effectively, hey, why do you guys do that? Well, we do that because we've always done that. <laughs> and that's, that's one, that is one leg of how they establish authority. Oh, we do that because that's how we've always done it. Oh, okay. And then the other way is the Pope speaking from the chair. And whatever the Pope says from the chair, it is unquestionable. That's how they establish authority. So if the Pope says something from the chair or of church tradition, if it conflicts with what's in the Bible, they say, no, nah, that's all right, because we don't have to follow the Bible. We follow church tradition, or we follow what the Pope has said. Now, if you think that diagram of the Southern Baptist Convention, if you think that was convoluted, you ain't seen nothing yet. I remember a few years ago when I was watching the stock market channel. For some reason, I didn't have any money. <laughs> but just in passing, they were talking about one of the largest shareholders back then of PepsiCo. And you want to guess who one of the largest shareholders was? All right? Who gives, who gives the Catholic Church the right to be its own nation, because that's what they are, right? They have statehood. Who gives them the right to do such things? They give themselves the right. 
The Lord doesn't do it, but my point is simply this. If silence is permissive, where does it stop? It doesn't. It doesn't. There is no getting it back in the back. So, to think about it, what's the answer? What's the answer? How do you reform that sort of theology? How do you reform that sort of thinking? You frankly don't. You don't, you don't reform that sort of theology. Men tried to reform it for a long time. You cannot reform garbage. <laughs> okay? You cannot reform something that is that is based on wrong ideas. What you have to do is what individuals started once again realizing you have to do. You have to go back to the beginning. You have to go back to the source. You can't reform, you can't reform wrong-headed thinking in that sense. You have to go back and you have to simply go back to the Bible and nothing but the Bible. It is what you have to do. You have to speak where the Bible speaks. And you have to be silent where the Bible is silent. 1 Peter 4, verse 11, as it says, If any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Anything more than that is not from God. All right? Anything more than that is not from God. You don't add to it. You don't take away from it. I had to have a, a talk with Lily um, this past week, and I told her, seriously, I said, Lily, just do what's in the Bible, and you will be okay. <laughs> Just do what's in Scripture. Anything more, anything more than the oracles of God, and it's garbage. It is absolute, absolute garbage. What does it mean as you think about, and we're back to where we began, anything more than Scripture is taking liberties with Scripture. You understand what I mean by that? If you were to say a young man took liberties with a young girl, what does that mean, that they took liberties with someone? It means they did something they had no authority to do. They did something they had no right to do. People take liberties with God's word. They're doing things they have no right to do. It is a liberal mindset. We are liberal in love. Because there is, no, there is no stopping love. But concerning these matters, we're talking about doing things in faith and other matters along those lines. If any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If it ain't in the Bible, don't want to hear it. It's not the basis of faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 Paul says, now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written. Just that concept. I understand there were specific things going on in Corinth. I get that. And guess what? Those specific things going on in Corinth are some of the same things that are still going on. So if you think Corinthians doesn't apply to modern day, you need to go back and study 1 Corinthians. Paul says... He wants them to learn, don't think, do not think beyond what is written. Read and obey what God has said. Then it will be done in faith. I shared a quote on the church's Facebook and Instagram page this past week, and I thought it was a pretty good quote. It's from Mark Twain, and it was something along, something along these lines. It is, easier to stay out of a it is easier to stay out of a mess than to get out of a mess. I want you to think about that. I think I actually paraphrased it in talking to someone else. It is, easier to get, it is easier to stay out of a pig pen than to get out of a pig pen. Right? Don't open up Pandora's box as you consider it. To think about the idea and to think about why these things matter in respecting the silence of Scripture and, and back to our point, worship. The Lord has told us how to worship. So when we talk about how to worship, we're talking about our singing, right? The Lord has told us how to sing. The Lord's Supper, the Lord has given commandments about the Lord's Supper. The collection, the Lord has given us commandments about the collection. 
And if we are not doing what is said in the Bible, then we are not operating in faith. And if you come back, as we have these discussions, if you come back and if you dare say, well, I think we ought to, don't give me that junk. Don't give me the garbage of, well, I think this, I think that. Everybody's got opinions. Everybody. You open up God's word. And if you want to think about, if you're right, I tell you what, go ahead and come up to 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy, pardon me. Come up to 2 Timothy. Because sometimes what happens in these discussions, people think, well, it's just, right, these are just semantics. And, and these are just doctrinal matters. And, you know, in you Church of Christ folks, y'all talk about doctrine all the time. You talk about doctrine like it's going out of style, and we just ought to talk more about love and grace and mercy and holding hands and singing kumbaya as though doctrine is wrong. Folks, we need to understand. The reason that doctrine matters is the same reason that faith matters. It's because we do what we do based on doctrine. All right? That's why doctrine matters. It is because that is kind of, as we learn, what to do. Don't think doctrine is a four-letter word. When Paul's writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, and he says, From childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. We're talking about scripture. We're not talking about man's words. We're not talking about some self-help book. We're talking about the word of God. All scripture is breathed out by God, and it is profitable for doctrine. So please don't begin to think doctrine does not matter. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. If your view is that, well, silence means, well, I can do whatever I want to do. You've missed why scripture was breathed out by God that we respect scripture. We respect scripture and frankly when it comes to when it comes to love, we love the Lord and we love others. And we love the truth. Now where a lot of folks fall short is that third one. They think they can love others and love the Lord and love the Lord, but as far as loving the truth, they're not too big on it. And they end up believing a lie. That's what Paul writes to the Thessalonians. Here, Paul, in talking to Timothy, he says, from childhood you've known. He's trying to get him to recognize the power and the purpose of Scripture. Chapter 4, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready, right? Timothy's in Ephesus is where he's at, by the way. He's in Ephesus. He's not in Judea. He's not in Jerusalem. He's in Ephesus. Paul says, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. Right? That's what was happening. That's what was going to happen. Right? He says this is what's going to happen, that you're going to have people, and they're not going to want sound doctrine, so what are they going to do? They're going to find a teacher or a preacher who who will be their own personal amen corner. That's what was going to happen. And that's what still happens. Right? They will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Turned aside to fables. If your idea, as we think about Scripture, if your idea of a good Bible study is, well, I think this, If your idea of a good Bible study is me saying, 
Well, you know, I really don't think that it means that. <laughs> if your idea of a good Bible study is not based on the Bible, you don't know what a good Bible study is. You better get into the Word. You better see exactly what the Word says. And I'll tell you right now, in looking at that passage, Paul is, whew, he's encouraging, as he calls him, his son. He's encouraging him and he warns him. He says, they're going to turn their ears away from the truth and they're going to be turned aside to fables. Verse 5, but you be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. And fulfill your ministry. Pretty serious stuff. Pretty serious. Paul says this is what's going to happen. And as you think about Timothy enduring afflictions, you need to understand who those afflictions were going to come from. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. They're going to prefer fables. They're going to prefer the, well, I think this. Paul says you're going to have to endure afflictions. It's a part of it. It's a part of it. Will we respect the silence of Scripture? God did, frankly. Come to Hebrews. Come over to the book of Hebrews. The Lord respected the silence of Scriptures. And it was the Scripture reading over in Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews 7 at verse 11, as it says, Therefore, Hebrews 7 verse 11, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there also there is also a change of the law. Right? Of necessity there is a change of the law. Why? Verse 13. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar, for it is ev evident that our Lord arose from Judah. Right? The argument is being made, if Jesus is high priest, if Jesus came to be high priest, how does that happen? He wasn't born of the tribe of Levi. He's not from the family of Aaron. How could he be priest? And the argument is made, that's why there had to be a change of the law. Because the old law was silent on priests coming from Judah. The law said nothing about it. It was silent. So the Lord respected that silence, and that's why there had to be a change to the law. Of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For it is evident, verse 14, that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident if, in the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest, who has come not according to the law of fleshly commandments, it's the Mosaic, but according to the power of an endless life. Just a wonderful, wonderful passage. Why did there have to be a change of the law? It's because the law was silent on priests coming from Judah. So there had to be a change of the law. That is one reason that the old law was nailed to the cross. It was to make way for the new. That's why it happened. Verse 19. Verse 19, it says, For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through faith, which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the, Melchi according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. And there were many priests because they were prevented um, they were prevented by death from continuing, but he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save us to the uttermost, those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For them. Verse 11, Therefore, if perfection, back earlier in verse 11, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, Right? There would have been no need for the Lord to come. If perfection. Are you interested in that? Because that is our invitation. We respect the silence of Scripture. 
we respect what the scripture says. We obey what the scripture says. Whether it is, whether we have been Christians our, you know, our whole life, as it is, or whether we are first obeying, we obey what scripture says. And we are thankful that we have a high priest, not according to the order of Levi, but according to the order of Melchizedek. We have a faithful high priest who continues to serve and to save to the uttermost those who come to him. The lesson, the lesson is yours. If you're here this morning, if you need to respond to it, right, as you think about Hebrews and the idea if perfection, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, there would have been no need for a second. If, if that appeals to you, that idea of perfection, the idea of the remission of our sins, the remission of our sins, if that does not appeal to you, that the Lord died for us, that his blood was shed for us, that everything that he endured on the cross and before the cross, as we talked about the Garden of Gethsemane this morning before the Lord's Supper, all those things that he endured are all pointing towards his Father's glorification and for the remission of our sins, establishing the new covenant. That is why we surrender to the Lord. All to him, all to Jesus, we surrender because he is Lord. This Jesus whom you crucified God hath made both Lord and Christ. He has the authority. We kneel unto him. We confess, we repent of our sins, and we are baptized. Baptized into him as it talks about. The lesson is yours. If you're here this morning and need to respond, please come while we stand and while we sing.